surroundings. Something else that can be ripped out, catheters. Be wary of your surroundings. If you rip a catheter out of somebody, you that's going to be something they never forget, and you'll never forget either. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I got a really bad story on that. I'll, I'll save it for the end. Remind me, okay? I got a really terrible story on catheters. Uh, yeah. Does it happen to like any of the students before? Yes. Mm. Yes. Because they were in a hurry, or like just not paying attention. Sometimes you get in a small room, there's a lot of equipment. You've got to be very careful. Always be wary of your surroundings, guys. My wife had four of these. Whenever she had a um, really complicated surgery, I'll save that story for later too. She almost died twice. That's another story. Mm. So they are tell all the stories. I, should, like, I don't want to. I don't want to waste on all the first semester. Yeah. So, but now, <laughs> but I have these two dots. I got all these discards. Like I said, all these cards of they from the treatment. Scars, yes. Because, and then I had. Also, because but why would I have had it, sir? If the ventilator was the water, why would you have two? But why would the why would the water be collected in my lungs because they were damaged? Yes, right, sir? yes, yes. It's a body defense mechanism a lot of times. Yes, yeah, like pus and stuff builds up in there. So another one that's very similar, guys, pneumothorax. So do not mix these two up. The terms are very similar. Pleural effusion is water on the lungs or fluid. Pneumothorax. Pneumo means air means air or gas in the cavity between the lungs and the chest wall. Very small area between the lungs and the chest wall. But it can fill up with air and it can actually cause a lung to collapse. It literally like shrivels up when we say collapse. Now what does it look like? This will be very black on the x-ray or high density as we say. Another term for a collapsed lung, guys, is what we call atelectasis or an atelectic lung. So pneumothorax, is air that's found between the lungs and the chest wall. It can cause the lung to collapse, and the term for a collapsed lung is atelectasis. Atelectasis, that's another important one to write down. Atelectasis. And if you look on a diagram, you can see how it really does, it actually makes that lung shrivel up. That's what we're talking about when it collapses. Pneumothorax. So a lot of times they'll put a little tube in there as well to allow that air to flow out and hopefully that lung will reinflate properly. Maybe that was the reason because my lungs were collapsed, that's what I've heard. That's so likely what happened. That, and also, for, they also just said it was for drainage, uh, like so. Mm -hmm. There'd be different tubes for drainage and yes, for those air? Yes, different tubes for drainage, for so then fluid, and different ones problem. for air, yes. Not exactly, not exactly, because drowning is more so that you've aspirated fluid in the lungs. Pleural effusion is whenever you have specific fluid built up between the layers of the pleura. So it's like really that right here. There's a lung, there is the pleura, it's going up with fluids. Usually it's like pus, like it's an infection based kind of fluid. Yeah, that's right there. Atelectasis is a collapsed lung. Tuberculosis, we've all heard about TB, right? Mm -hmm. Tuberculosis, you ever had to give a little TB test under the skin? You've all had that? So tuberculosis, that is characterized by it being an infectious bacterial disease. Key word there is infectious bacterial-based disease. You're gonna learn this in um, your next class as well because you'll start talking about bacteria. Now, what does it look like? It's actually gonna look like little nodules that we call tubercles in the tissues. And on an x-ray, it actually looks like little nodules that we're gonna see. Key word there, once again, for tuberculosis is an infectious bacterial disease. And it causes growth of nodules on the lungs. So we have a special mask you typically wear for that, TV mask. You'll see those when you get to the hospital. The TV warning, make sure you do wear that because it's a very contagious disease. Very easy to transmit between people. So did you say infected bacterial disease causes the nodules? Or? Correct. And that's what it looks like. You look at little it. patches on, on the lungs right there. Oh, yeah. mm. That's those little nodules we're talking about. What's that black spot down right here? Mm -hmm. That's just air in the stomach. In the stomach. That's where your stomach is. Mm -hmm. 
And they can be anywhere on the lungs, not just these two areas. You can see them in little patches all over the place. If it is a little place, then it's not an extreme case. Correct. Is it possible to be totally white, sir? Does it get in the... It, yes, it can get that bad. I mean, that would be like... Like in a bad stage. Oh, I see. Like the last, death, yes. last stage is. Yes. Life. Pneumonia. I've had this twice. Mm -hmm. Not something to mess around with. Pneumonia is lung inflammation, and it's caused by bacteria or viral infection. He was there bacteria or viral. Now, what happens? The air sacs, those alveoli that we talked about a couple of days ago, they fill with pus, and sometimes they become solid. It causes a lot of difficulty breathing, a lot of coughing. Feels like you're drowning. So it's like you're drowning in pus. Best way I can describe it. One of my earliest memories as a child, I remember having that. I had to um, back then they used to put some these little tents, air tents that had uh, medication pumped into them, and you breathe in the medication, it would help break up that pus in your lungs. So one of my earliest memories of, memories of a child is laying in that tent, being surrounded by it with my teddy bear. I still remember that to this day. I was. Three years old, mm -hmm. my earliest memory. <laughs> but it's gonna look similar to tuberculosis, but it'll be a little more solid because those alveoli are filling up with that pus. It becomes very, very high contrast, very white looking on a radiograph. Yes? Can the pneumonia be uh, combined with another, like, with cheese? Yeah, I mean, you can get pneumonia from COVID. You can get, I mean, you can have a lot of overlap on those diseases, yes. Absolutely. So when you say um, similar to tuberculosis, but it's more intense, mean more intense meaning? So tuberculosis has more individualized patches, whereas pneumonia is like a very concentrated area that's solidified. Yeah. All right, aspiration pneumonia. It's another type of pneumonia. What's that word aspiration mean again? When you swallow something in your head tract. We breathe something we should not breathe in. Oh, not swallow, it's something we breathe in. Breathe so in. that's going to happen whenever we aspirate food, saliva, liquids, or vomit. Breathe into the lungs. It leads to those airways, it messes up those bronchi, and causes infection. Now on the left, is just a typical case of aspiration pneumonia. Over on the right is a very extreme case here. I don't know if we haven't talked about this. Does anybody know what in the world this person aspirated on the right here? Contrast. Probably. Contrast, yeah. yes. Because we do a lot of contrast studies where we swallow barium. So this person aspirated contrast in the lungs. You see the trachea is filled up with contrast. And look, you can really see all those little bronchi, right? Those little tertiary, secondary bronchi. All the little parts there. Bring them all the way in. As you can imagine, very painful, very uncomfortable very um, critical thing that can happen that can actually kill you. So. We should choke to death, sir. You can, yes. Yes, you can. How do they, uh, how do they release that stuff from the patient? They probably had to, uh, try to, they probably had to go to surgery and try to get it out as quick as possible, if I'm gonna guess. Yeah. Yeah, pull it out with a syringe, something. The barium's, so toxic, right? the barium's gonna coat the, the walls, so. This may actually be posts um, withdrawal, but there's still some barium like coating the walls a little bit. Now we'll actually start to throw away. Because uh -huh. when you swallow it, it's going to stay in your esophagus sometimes and your stomach, and kind of coat those walls a bit. And yeah, let's move on. Let's move on. We got to move a little faster here. Sorry. Real quick, guys, what is this? Pneumonia. You're going to guess. Pneumonia. Uh, it's, uh, that's tuberculosis. Something we should all know a lot about by now. COVID. It's COVID, yes. Oh, that's what really? COVID looks like. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> that's <good. laughs> yes. That's what a very advanced case of COVID looks like on a chest x ray. Now, there's one more pathology I want you to write down emphysema. Emphysema is a very um, important pathology because when a patient has emphysema, the lungs are breaking down. Usually, it's brought on by excessive smoking, but that's not the only reason. Emphysema is a basically a decaying of the lungs that are becoming more brittle. Thus, when the lungs become more brittle or more porous, we just have to bring our techniques down, like our KPR mass, to take those x-rays. But go ahead and write that down. Remember to see that as well. The lungs become more porous. They're going to break down. So we're now 
I'm gonna get into some positioning. We're gonna start with our soft tissue neck positioning. Now this should seem like a little bit of review because we've all had this in lab already. So we're gonna go over how we actually position these positions and what we need to see on the radiograph to be acceptable to send to our radiologist. So we'll start off with the positioning aspects, then we'll go over what's called evaluation criteria. Evaluation criteria is what we must have on that radiograph in order to be considered optimal enough to send to our doctors. So when I go over that evaluation criteria, that's very important to know. You don't want to send something that is lacking in that evaluation criteria. So let's start with our soft tissue neck positions, of which we only have two, that being the AP and the lateral. Now, what structures are we going to see specifically on a soft tissue neck? This, just what we talked about a little bit earlier with this monia, the cervical spine or the soft tissues of the anterior neck. Now, of those two I just named, what is the star of the show on that radiograph? What is our star of the show? What are we focused on the most for soft Thank tissue you. neck? Anterior. The anterior aspects of the neck. So even though the C-spine will be on there, our star of the show is the soft tissues of the neck. Why? Because the most common reason we will do a soft tissue neck x-ray is to look for foreign bodies. So most of your patients that come in with this x-ray, you'll look on the request, it usually says that they feel like there's a bone or something stuck in their throat. Not the only reason, but that's the most common reason. Foreign bodies that are lodged in the airway or the esophagus. Now what are some other reasons? Swelling, specifically the epiglottis may become swollen. Masses, because people do develop masses in that area. And then fractures of the larynx and the hyoid bone. Fractures of the larynx and the hyoid bone. That's more rare. So put that big bold red for you because that's the most common reason we will do that x-ray. So if you had a question that says patient presents with a foreign body lodged in their throat, what would you suggest to be ordered? You would order a soft tissue neck x-ray series. Most common reason I used to do those was for fish bones and coins. Because man, kids love to swallow coins. Keep coins away from your kids. Don't you really? And those little marbles, too. Marbles, magnets, magnets are business too. Magnets are serious because magnets can actually cause a lot of internal damage. Can you take an MRI? Hmm? No, do not take an MRI. You want a big hole in his belly. Send them straight to X-ray. Now, when we do these patients, we got to ensure our patients are prepped correctly. There are a lot of artifacts that can get in the way of a soft tissue neck series. First of all, make sure any of the clothing that's in the neck area is removed aside from a gown. Artifacts in the hair. And let me tell you, those bobby pins, they just, people forget they have bobby pins in their hair. I've got a wife and two daughters. I find bobby pins all over the place in my house. <laughs> those bobby pins are notoriously sneaky. Make sure you have talked to your patient and ensure they've removed anything that's in their hair. Scrunchies, bows, hair bands jewelry, and hair itself. Wigs. Wigs, yes, wigs. And they might be offended if you ask them to remove their wig, but you know, <laughs> if they refuse, you document that to try to get them to remove it. But hair itself can really show up on an x-ray, especially ponytails, um, dreadlocks, they show up really bad, different types of hair. If a patient has longer hair, if they can't put it up in a bun, simply have them move it to the side. Move it to the side as much as possible. You may have to assist them at some point. They put on a lead jacket, Help them hold that hair out of the way while someone else shoots the x-ray for you. Not you as a student, but as a tech. The hair is going to be one of your enemies on those x-rays particularly. Make sure you've moved it out of the way because it will show up like a streak artifact. Covering up those structures that we want to see. All right, so let's talk about the criteria. So you're going to look in your book and you're going to see this business right here. I don't like how this is working with the centimeters. Focus on the inches. Inches are what you want to focus on. So 10 by 12 cassette means 10 inches by 12 inches. You're going to use a 10 by 12 cassette lengthwise. It's always going to be a lengthwise cassette. You will not do that crosswise. 10 by 12 lengthwise cassette, and you're always going to utilize a 40 inch SID. Now for patient position, you have the option of doing them upright or supine. What do I have highlighted? Upright, because upright will be the preferred position if they can do it. If they absolutely cannot stand, you have the option of supine, which means what, by the way? Lying down. Lying on your back, like you see in the picture. Upright will always be the preferred way to do that x-ray in particular, though. 10 by 12 cassette, lengthwise. 
I'm just going to focus on the inches, not so much the centimeters. You see all those numbers. Yes, we're going to get to that. Good point. Correct, 40 inch SID. It's also going to be for the lateral, and Mr. Fung will explain that to you guys in lab. We haven't had lab this week yet. Um, 40 inch is going to apply to your AP and your lateral view, your soft tissue necks. That is a change from the last textbook. Now, park position. We want that MSP centered to the perpendicular midline of the grid. Basically, we're using that MSP as a centering point to make sure they are centered to our cassette properly. We're going to make sure the patient's shoulders lie in the same transverse plane. In other words, we don't want them to scrunch their shirts up. We want them to be nice and relaxed. And then we are going to extend the patient's neck slightly. Why? Once again, what's the star of our show on this radiograph? The anterior neck. Therefore, we got to bring the chin up slightly to expose that neck because that's the main area that we are uh, we are x-raying for that radiograph. So make sure that chin is elevated slightly. That's very important. Do not have it slouched over. That's going to defeat the purpose of that x-ray. If the chin is relaxed, the chin will cover up the air-filled trachea. So bring that chin up. Mid sagittal plane. Y'all thought I was lying when I said we were going to use our words again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, central ray. Where does our central ray go? Well, it is going to be a perpendicular central ray, which means that we're not at an angle on this x ray. Perpendicular central ray at the level of the laryngeal prominence. What is that laryngeal prominence again? The Adam's, Adam's, Adam's apple. apple. So directly on the Adam's apple or manubrium. Now why would I say or manubrium? There's an alternative x-ray where you will radiograph the airway a little bit more inferior, but I want you to focus on the one where you center on the laryngeal prominence because that's the one the registry will focus on. Your book does have two different ways to do this. The one in red is the most important one to know, laryngeal prominence, and that's also what you're doing in the lab. Also very important, people miss this still. I have seniors missing this question. Exposure is made during slow inspiration to ensure the trachea is filled with air. Now what does that mean? If I'm taking my x-ray, I'm gonna tell my patient to just take controlled breaths, in and out, just breathe normally, controlled breaths, and as they breathe in, I will make my exposure. Why is that important? Because what's the start of the show again? Yeah, the trachea, the airway, the anterior neck. And I want air in there so I can see it on the x-ray. Therefore, I make my exposure as they're breathing in. I do not want to make my x-ray as they're breathing out because it's going to be invisible. As they inspire, that slow inspiration to fill that trachea with air. That's going to be part of your lab test out as well, guys. Make sure your instructions you give your patient in lab is that they're just breathing normally and you're taking your exposure as they breathe in. Very important point to that x-ray. All right, so evaluation criteria. What do we need to see? And I'll show you some radiographs as well of what we need to see. We need evidence of proper collimation. You need to collimate horizontally. Horizontal collimation is essential because the neck is quite thin, right? Even on a 10 by 12, we'll have a lot of extra light on the sides. The more we collimate, the more we're protecting our patient and the more quality that x-ray is going to show. So we want proper collimation. We want an air-filled upper airway. If we see that radiologist an x-ray, the AP upper airway, and there's no air in that trachea, he's going to send him right back and make us repeat it because he can't make a read on that x-ray because he cannot see the trachea. So we have an air-filled upper airway. And how do we get that? What do we do to ensure that? Breathe in. Breathe slow. Take the x-rays, they're breathing in, right? Good. We also want no rotation. We want to make sure their back is nice and firm against that IR. Make sure their head's not turned. Make sure they're looking straight ahead. Even a slight turn of the head can actually throw that off because we want that trachea projected against the C-spine with air so we can see it properly. Now, how do we ensure that there's no rotation? Our spinous processes, which are these little dots in the middle of the spine, we'll show you 
are equidistant to the pedicles and align with the midline of the cervical body. Now that probably sounds like a foreign language right now, but we'll show you what that's talking about. This is what the spinous processes would be right in the middle of our neck. They look like little circles, I'll show you in just a second. Now this second bullet point is for that alternative position that you see in your book on the AP upper airway. Once again, I want you to focus on the red, on the red on this. This third bullet point is just an alternative way to do that position, but we do not need to focus on that one. They're not going to ask you that when you're registered. All right, so looking at this x-ray, does this meet all the criteria we just talked about? First of all, let me show you what the spinous processes are that I'm talking about. These little dots here, you see them? Those are our spinous processes. If they're in the center, that means that they're in a nice, true AP. They don't have their head turned. Now, do y'all think that meets all the evaluation criteria that we talked about? Yes or no? No. So here's some no's. Why not? The air is not here, the track is not turning. Hmm. You said rotation. How do you know the rotation? Uh, there is slight rotation, you're correct. So evaluating this radiograph, we do have a little bit of rotation. Even though our spinous processes are pretty much in the center, they are slightly off. Mm -hmm. But how else can we tell? Look up here. We can tell the chin is turned. Why? There are two little points on your jaw right here. If you feel that on your face, they're called the gonions. That's the corners of your mandible. They look like little points up here. We see one, but not the other. That tells us that the head's been turned. If you see both your little gonions, it means the head's nice and straight. It's everything you can look for. Also, you want these in the center. You can see they're slightly off. Airfield trachea, we can sort of see, but it's kind of like it disappears here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is actually a pathology that we're seeing right here. This trachea has been narrowed. See how it gets narrow right here? Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a narrowed trachea. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue that patient is having with their airway. And there's something stuck in there that we can't see, or they're having some kind of other pathology going on. So they came in for like trouble breathing or something like that. Mm -hmm. So does it drop it? Does it? It may be. It may be. We don't know for sure. We have to do a lateral view to confirm that. I was. It kind of does, right? Um, I was looking at the. I think that's the clavicle. Uh, um, looks like one is higher right than the other. Yes. That means the shoulders are probably mm -hmm. shifted. There's some of that anatomy later for you guys. Now you don't need to know infraglottic cavity or remoglottitis unless you just want to. It's kind of a fun word. Remoglottitis. That's what you're. That'd be a fun one to use at the dinner table. You know, I'm telling you, use these at the dinner table. Man, I got stuck in my remoglottitis. It's a little that chicken's a little dry. You don't need to know your. I'm gonna use that one for next Thanksgiving. Ooh, my remoglottitis. That turkey's dry. Ooh, that's something that you, yeah. Next time you cook it. This is the that's a portion, is it the, is it the, that's a portion yes. of the larynx. But you don't need to know these three guys. I want you to focus on that just being an air-filled trachea. Air-filled trachea and of course the apices in your lungs here. Um, that's the main anatomy there that you can lay in. Anything in this area, we're talking about bones, it's just your C vertebrae for now. We're going to label them specifically later, but for now they're just C vertebrae. Uh, the remoglottitis was that spot that you said was the patient was having some trouble with? Yeah, okay. yeah. We heard a little narrowing. There's another example of a soft tissue neck. Does that meet our evaluation criteria? Yeah. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with this x ray? You can see there. Head, right? Yeah, they could those side by side. The what do you think happened here? Are they centered in the right spot? Yes or no? No. no? Are we centered on the laryngeal prominence? Mm -hmm. No, we're probably centered down here like on the jugular notch, so it looks like mm -hmm. to me. So, even though we can still see the airfield trachea, we might be cutting some of it off up here. So that's centered too low on that radiograph. But you do see your airfield trachea very nicely. You see your spinous processes. Mm -hmm. Let's go to our lateral. Lateral soft tissue neck. 
So once again, we're using the same exact cassette size, the same orientation, 10 by 12 lengthwise cassettes. Write this down because there was a, a uh, mistake in lab. This will be a 40 inch SID. In fact, Merrill's does state, if you ever look in your book and they do not specify an SID, it's automatically assumed to be 40 inches. So that's gonna be a 40 inch SID. Once again, you have the option of seated or standing. You do want to preferably have them standing or upright, once again, standing upright. What's nice about this position is we're basically just turning them on their side and doing it almost the exact same way, because even the centering is gonna be the exact same way as our APU. Mm -hmm. Forty inch SID. Write that down. Make sure you make that correction in your notes. This guy was gonna be so over taking these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same. This is the same exact picture I had in two thousand eight. Though it's kind of funny when I learned out this book. They got they got a bunch of different ones in there, but this guy, he's been in these, this book for like forever. <laughs> This guy, this is the Photoshop guy. <laughs> if you look at his face, he almost doesn't look human. But they did some kind of filter on his face. Can you see that? Like stock high, images. High it looks like a, like a Ken doll, like, <laughs> like a Barbie doll, like doesn't look human. Anyway, back to positioning. <laughs> MSP is centered parallel midline to the grid. Very important, make sure you clasp the hands behind the body, like this. Why would you want to do this? Bring the shoulders out of the way. To get the shoulders out of the way, because what's the start of the show once again? Answer your neck. I want to bring my hands behind my back to get the shoulders out of the way and also to kind of protrude the neck a little bit. So you want to focus on that interior neck. We're also, while we put the hands behind the body, rotate the shoulders slightly posterior. Why? Once again, we're going to get it out of that field of view so it's not going to mess up our x ray. And then we're going to extend that neck slightly for the same reason as the AP, because once again, start of the show, anterior neck. That upper airway. You want to see that trachea nice and free of superimposition so we get a good, beautiful x ray of it. Now, this x ray, make note, this is centered too low. Because your center is actually going to be on the laryngeal prominence. I think that's in your book. Mm -hmm. That is centered too low with the method that we're going to stick with. That's an alternative method for looking at the lower airway, but we're focused on the laryngeal prominence centering because we're focused on that trachea specifically the entirety of that trachea in the lateral view. Oh, where did they center in that picture? They centered almost at the jugular notch, it's like to me. Very close to it. So similarly to the previous slides? Mm -hmm. Now where is that CR gonna be? We're gonna have a once again a perpendicular central ray, no angle. It's gonna be horizontal through the MCP at the level of the laryngeal prominence once again. That's for our upper airway. Now there is that alternative method in your book where you're looking at the lower airway. I want you to once again focus on this that I have highlighted in red. We are focused on the laryngeal prominence centering method, the upper airway, upper trachea. Same exact thing as the AP. We're making our exposure during slow inspiration to make sure that trachea is nice and filled with air during slow inspiration. Very important because once again, if we do it on expiration, we're not going to see that trachea. It's going to be invisible. And we're not going to get that nice diagnostic image just into that radiologist. So Mr. Fong will make this correction in lab as well because I think he taught you on a different centering point for the lateral. Once again, that's from the old book that we use, but this is the method right here you need to focus on, on that laryngeal prominence. He will make that correction tomorrow. Who's seated and upright? Seated and upright. Upright preferred. I mean, um, like standing preferred. They're both upright, but standing preferred over seated. All right, what do we want to see on that lateral? Once again, that evidence of proper collimation. Now, once again, just like the AP, when you collimate for this x ray, you only want to collimate horizontally, you don't want to collimate superior and inferior because it is a long body part. You want to see it in its entirety. Focus on horizontal collimation to bring that light field in. We want that air field upper airway once again. 
from the pharynx to the proximal trachea specifically, from the pharynx to the proximal trachea. A little different than the AP because in the lateral, we can actually make out the pharyngeal areas. So from the pharynx to the proximal trachea. That bullet point number three, you don't have to worry about, that's an alternative method. Then we want no rotation or tilt of the cervical spine. We check that by having what we call superimposed zygopophyseal joints. Don't have to worry about those yet. That's RAD Pro 3. Open intervertebral joints and nearly superimposed mandibular rami. Basically, the jaw needs to be superimposed upon itself. You don't need a head tilted. I love zygopophyseal joints. They're fun to talk about. That'll be in two more semesters. showing some of that beautiful anatomy. Once again, don't worry about laryngeal vestibule. Just know that that's the larynx. That's what I want you to focus on. Epiglottis, we can see. Hyoid bone. Thyroid cartilage. Even though they have this label right there as thyroid cartilage, typically you cannot visualize that thyroid cartilage. This person in particular, you actually can make it out slightly. That's why it's a little bit um, white. Y'all see what I'm talking about? But most of your patient does is going to be invisible. Infraglottic cavity, don't need to know that. No, that's the airfield trachea. Airfield trachea, larynx, epiglottis, hyoid bone. Know your C1 and C2, or your atlas and your axis. And of course, that's just some of your mandible right there. Up here would be the what? Nasopharynx. What is this specifically right here with the air in it? Nasopharynx. Right below that would be oropharynx, and then. The ridge of pharynx. Starting to piece it together a little bit. Mm -hmm. See it a little bit more. That does not stand for pounds. <laughs> That's initials. <laughs> All right, let's go to the chest. We've got about six more minutes here. We're just going to go a little bit more forward here. So, chest is going to have a lot more positions. That was your upper airway. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the x ray that you'll do more of than anything else in your life. The chest x-ray. You'll do more chest x-rays in your career than probably anything else that you'll ever do. The most common type of x-ray that we do in this field. So you can guarantee the registry will ask you a lot of questions on it. So what do we got to do for a proper chest x-ray? Lots of prep, as you guys have learned in lab. Patient prep, which we'll go over specifically. The general patient position, of which there is a preferred method, but we have alternatives. Our IR size and our collimation size is also going to be extremely important. Almost everything that we do for chest x-rays on adults will always utilize that 14 by 17 cassette. The orientation will differ between the patients, but 14 by 17 is the go-to size. SID for all your chest x-rays, guys. Go ahead and write this down to the start, because I promise you this will never change, despite some of the sloppy techs doing it differently. SID will always be 72 inches for all, capital A-L-L, -L, all chest x-rays. 72 inches for all chest x-rays, even portables, which techs will not do. Even portables, they need to be 72 inches. Proper ID markers, our radiation protection, and our patient instructions, like those breathing instructions. Yes, I didn't mention it on the upper airways. We are using shielding on all these x-rays, very important. Now, body habits will play a part, guys, of course, in your cassette orientation. Now, typically on the majority of your patients, if they're anything but hypersthetic, your lengthwise cassette orientation will typically work on most of your patients. But you'll see, and this is kind of a preference thing, most of the time for a male patient, you typically will stick with a crosswise cassette, females lengthwise. Does that apply to all? Because some males are very thin, but most of your male patients can typically be on that crosswise, females, lengthwise. Body habits though, all three of these, aside from hypersthenic, would fit on lengthwise. Hypersthenic being very wide, best you'd be that crosswise cassette orientation. And y'all seen these pictures before, these are a little bit different. These are all three lengthwise cassettes. This would be a crosswise cassette, because the hypersthenic causes the lungs to become very wide, whereas the other three body habits, the lungs are more long. So lengthwise versus crosswise is going to be very important whenever we're trying to get these x-rays done properly on our patients. 
body habits, and of course, gender, once again, plays a factor. Males crosswise, females lengthwise, typically. Most males are more broad, therefore their lungs are more broad. All right, so how do we prep our patients? Boy, there is so much stuff that can mess up your chest x-ray, let me tell you. Chest x-rays, you're probably gonna repeat these more than anything else because you tell a patient to take their jewelry off, they say it's off and it's still there. You tell them to take the leads off, little stickers, they're off, they say they're off and they're still there. You say, take your shirt off, they said I did, it's still there. You gotta be firm with those instructions, guys, because these artifacts will mess up your chest x-rays and you don't want to have to repeat them and re-expose your patients. Make sure all those artifacts are removed from the anatomy of interest. Anatomy of interest is the chest and the lungs, of course. Earrings, I didn't mention earrings on the last slides with the neck, but earrings, gotta get those out of your patient's ears. Well, I just had them pierced, I can't remove them. I still need you to try to remove them. If they refuse, we document. Please take your necklace off. Oh, but this is special, I don't wanna cut it. I still need you to take the necklace off because it's gonna show up on your x-ray and interfere with what we're trying to see. If they still refuse, we document that they refuse to do it. But we're still gonna to try to encourage them to remove those artifacts out of the way. Clothing artifacts, everything from the waist up. Make sure you specify that you don't just say, I need you to take everything from the waist up off because they'll go in the bathroom, change, come back with a gown, the shirt's off, but they still have a bra on. Oh, I have to take the bra off too? Yes, make sure you say everything from the waist up, including your bra. Now, men in the room, say that carefully. Don't just walk up to the patient and say, hey, take your bra off, let's take your x-ray. <laughs> Make sure you explain to them why I need you to remove everything from the waist up, including your bra, so we can get a good x-ray of your lungs. Explain why you're doing it. Don't just tell them to take their clothes off. Be careful in how you say that. Um, breasts. Breast tissue is actually an artifact. If you have a patient with large breasts, now this can be uncomfortable. We have to ask them to move the breasts out of the way. So how do we do that? We say, I need you to lift your breasts and spread them to the side. It's only for patients with larger breasts because breast tissue will interfere with the lungs and wipe them out so we can't see the air properly. So yes, you have to ask your patients to lift their breasts and spread them to the side before they put their chest up against the board. Now, once again, with dignity, don't just say, can you move your breasts all the way? I need you to lift your breasts and spread them so we can get a better view of your lungs today. Simple as that. You had a question? Well, they can't remove those, but, yeah. but <laughs> you would just document the patient has breast implants, and usually it's in their chart, but yeah, yeah, we do see that as well. I've got some x-rays to show you, matter of fact, what that looks like. Um, and of course, secure all their possessions in a designated manner and location, so they don't lose it, but as you see, there's a lot of stuff that will interfere with our chest x-rays. So we've got to make sure that we are going through that checklist in our head to make sure they've done all this and that we're not going to, have to do any repeats because we don't want to repeat these x-rays because of stuff showing up. And you're going to see all kinds of stuff, guys. All kinds of stuff. Uh, but I didn't mention piercing. Nipple rings, guys. Nipple rings are a lot more popular these days. Make sure you say, are you sure you don't have any other piercings that you need to remove? Just remind them, anything that's in that area needs to be out of that x-ray, out of the way. Um, we get a lot of x-rays for those. Speaking of, there we go, guys. We have artifacts all over that left x-ray. These are leads. Now, a lot of your patients with leads are usually in critical care. They can't help that these are in the way. But if they come to our department and they're walkie-talkie, sometimes they've had an EKG done, and they still have those stickers all over their chest. So we need to make sure that they have removed those because they will show up on our x-rays. With the exception of one type of patient, and write this down remember it because my wife has to have this all the time, it's what's called a halter monitor. Halter monitor is a device that a patient has to wear to monitor their heart rates over a period of time that cannot be removed or it will actually make the study useless and they have to start over. So always remove leads with the exception of a patient with a halter monitor. How do you know a halter monitor patient has come in? Usually they'll say it on their documentation, but they'll have the leads and it's all connected to a little box in their pocket. It's a little rectangular box. Halter monitor patients. What did this patient fail to do? I mean, she's you know really silent for that X-ray, but um, obviously we would not want to send that to the doctor, right? Don't send, please don't send that to the doctor. They're just gonna laugh at you, and you're probably gonna humiliate yourself. And um, it's probably covering like a lot of the anatomy that it, they're looking at. It is I mean, very clearly. Is the old the, is that tuberculosis or this? That's, that's just regular hilar markings. Okay. But if a mistake like this has been made, you won't send this to the doctor. No, you should not. What do y'all think happened here? 
What do y'all think happened here? I'm outside. That's hair, yes. It's hair with little, little, um, I forget what they're called, beads. Beads in there, yes. So, and the hair was not moved to the side. You gotta get that hair out of the way. What happened here, guys? Most common for your female patients. Do not remove the bra. You cannot send that to the doctor. Do not send it to the doctor. So they can't see the bra again? On the left, what happened? Uh, yeah. Piercings. So you say we can send these to the doctor, so we would take all these other x-rays, but what do we do with those? Like we don't, we just disregard them? You, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't send them through. And your text will show you how that works. Yeah. On the right, what happened, guys? That's what implants look like. No, you cannot remove implants. No, not tell your patients to remove their implants. It's not going to happen. But obviously, you would document accordingly before you send that. The circles are the implants. The circles, yes. That's nice. We'll stop there, guys. I'm, I'm, whoa. Oh, oh, oh. Well, let's start over. Okay. So, chest anatomy. What is it? Quick highlight. So, who needed to have it? Oh, yeah. Um, so, y'all want to hear that catheter story real quick? Yeah. Okay. You can hit the lights. So, 